So we've been talking about some idols that sneak their way into our lives. There are things that a lot of times that we look at as good things, sometimes even life goals, but they sneak their way into our lives and they become more important or they take the place of God in our lives. That's what we've been looking at. Not, not the big ones like we know about, like, you know, money, fame, success, all these things that can be idols, entertainers. How about sports? Anybody up late last night? Anybody have trouble going to sleep last night after that game? Like, wow, like, you know, man, it's like so exciting, but we can become obsessed with those things, and they can obviously become more important than God in our lives. But what we've been doing in this series is talking about some of the less obvious idols. In fact, in the first week, we talked about family, and family is an incredible blessing. I love my family so much, and God has blessed each of us with a family, and family is one of those blessings in life, though, if we're not careful, we can make it more important than God, and it can become a sneaky idol. And last week, we talked about pleasing people, people people-pleasing. I mean, it's great to be kind, to serve others, to put others first, but sometimes we can go so far with that that it becomes an idol in our lives, and we do it for what we get back from it. And we got to be careful about people-pleasing. But today we talk about what I call a very tricky one, and it's contentment, the sneaky idol of contentment. Because if you read the Bible, you know that the Bible says that we should be content. In fact, some of you know that verse in Timothy that says, godliness with contentment is great gain. We're encouraged to be content. So we're encouraged to be content, and yet we're saying today that contentment could be a sneaky idol in our lives. So we're going to get into that today. And I want to begin by just giving us some definition, because when you talk about contentment, the world's view of contentment, and then the biblical view of contentment, we want to know, are they the same thing? Do they line up, or do they contradict each other? So let's begin with the world's definition. Simply define the world's definition of contentment is a state of happiness in satisfaction. You guys know what contentment is, a state of happiness and satisfaction in the world's eyes. And when I think of contentment, I think about that holiday that's just two months away. Now, the big one, three months away, is my favorite, Christmas, but my second favorite is Thanksgiving. How many of you love Thanksgiving, right? I mean, it's just one of those holidays where you just kind of, like, I know if you're in the kitchen making all the food, it's not that relaxing, but there's this sense of contentment that comes with a moment where you're just like, you know what, I'm really grateful for the life that I have. I feel this sense of contentment. My life isn't perfect. You know, there's things that could be better in my life, but I'm really grateful for where I am, and I have this ease of mind on Thanksgiving. And if you get to the end of the day on Thanksgiving and you don't feel that sense of contentment, my advice and encouragement to you is to eat another piece of pie. (laughs) I, I really believe that is the answer. It works sometimes for me. So anyway, the truth is, Contentment is something I think we all want when we think about the blessings of God. We should be happy. We should be satisfied with what we have. I think we can all grasp this idea, this feeling. I think we want it, like to, to be content. That's something we want. I think the older we get, the more that we want it. And I believe that we as human beings, we really want contentment. We really pursue it because of what it brings to our lives. And I think contentment brings this, this word, freedom. When we are content, we are free. We're free to be the person that we're meant to be, to enjoy who we are, to enjoy our lives, because we're content with what we have and who we are. I'm guessing to this point, most of you are thinking, okay, well, that sounds really good. I think contentment is something I want, something that we should all want to have in our lives. I mean, we all want to be in a place, right, where we're satisfied with, you know, our house, our cars, our clothes, our bank account, like, okay, I'm satisfied with what I have. I'm content. I'm content with my relationships. Like, um, if I'm married, I'm, I'm thankful, I'm happy in my marriage. If I have kids, if I have great friends, I'm content in my relationships. We want that. We want meaningful relationships. If you have a job, you hope that you're content with the job to the place that it brings fulfillment to you. You're making a difference in some way in this world. Whether you go up the ladder or not, There's a sense of contentment, and if you're a believer in God, you're like, I'm content that I have a faith in God, and I feel good about that. This is all kind of the world's view of contentment in a lot of ways. We could add to the list, some of you are thinking of other things that bring you contentment, and it feels good to talk about it and to have contentment, but what I want you to do with me today is look into the Bible 
You say, what does the Bible say about contentment? What does the Bible teach? So we're going to begin by looking at two different passages from the Apostle Paul. One was written to a church in Philippi. So it's Philippians chapter 4. And I'm going to read a few verses to you where he talks about contentment. Beginning with verse number 11, Paul says, Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content. Which if we pause there for a moment, just so you know, contentment is something we have to learn. It's not like automatic. We've got to learn to be content. He said, I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or how to live with everything. I know how to be poor. I know how to be rich. I've learned to be content in either situation. Then in verse 12, he said, I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, whether it's with plenty or little. And then he says, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. A lot of you recognize verse 13, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Let me just take a, a moment to burst a few of your bubbles, those of you that are Christian athletes, and you've made this your verse. This is the verse that helps me to hit a home run or score a goal or run a marathon. This is not a verse about sports. Paul wasn't talking about that when he said, I can do all things through Christ. What he was talking about was I can be content. Jesus gives me the power to be content when life is good, when life is bad, when I have a lot, when I have a little. That's what he's talking about. That's the context of that verse. So for a Christian, it's not like the biblical view of contentment is in direct opposition to the world's view, but there are some nuances we're looking at to see that it's a little bit different than the world's view. For a Christian, we come to a place of contentment not by adding enough to get to that level that makes us content, but it's more about subtraction. So here's the biblical view. If you're taking notes, contentment does not come by adding to what you have, but by subtracting from what you desire. The world says, hey, you'll find contentment when you raise your level of possessions, money, stuff, relationships, all to the level that you decided that you need for happiness. But when you look at what God's word says, it's like we need to maybe lower some of those things that we think we need, some of those expectations down to a certain level where we're content no matter with what we have. So this is what Paul says in Philippians 4. Now, we're going to flip over to another passage, another writing from Paul, but this time he's writing to a young man named Timothy. In fact, right when I started the message, I referred to one of these verses, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. So we're going to read that in context and read about five verses that go with that. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, Paul says, True godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. Some of your translations may, it's great gain, may say that. Paul's saying this, if you have godliness, what is godliness? It's becoming more like God, acting like God. And now we don't know God firsthand as much as we know Jesus, and Jesus was God. So we are, as Christians, called to be more like Jesus. So if you are becoming more like Jesus, and you're content with your life in Jesus and what he's given you, he says that leads to great gain or great wealth in your life. Very simple formula. It's a huge advantage if we understand godliness with contentment, it's great gain. Now, verses 7 and 8. Paul says, After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can take nothing with us when we leave it. So, if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Now, I think most of you have heard verse 7 before in some way, shape, or form in your life. The idea is you're born with nothing and you leave with nothing. You've brought nothing into this world, you'll take nothing out. I've said this before, but if you're ever watching a funeral procession and there's the hearse that's carrying the body that's going to the cemetery, you've never seen a trailer hooked up behind it with that person's possessions, right? You can't take it with you. You know that, but yet sometimes we don't live that way. And Paul is saying, hey, we should be content. Because if we think we can accumulate a lot of stuff and take it with us, we cannot. And then he says in verse 9 and 10, there's some serious consequences. If you don't learn this, he says, People who long to be rich fall into temptation, and they're trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. 
And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So those five verses, I want to break it down for just a moment. And I want to give you four truths about biblical contentment, okay? I want to talk about what these verses teach us about biblical contentment. And some of you are thinking, that this is great, but you also told us at the beginning it's a sneaky idol. So why is it good and then it's bad? We're going to get there. Just hold on. Stick with me. It's important that we establish this and understand what true biblical contentment is, which we should strive for. Okay, so the first thing that we look at here in this passage and find is that contentment that's rooted in being more like Jesus leads to greatness. Contentment rooted in being more like Jesus. What was Jesus like? He didn't own a home. He wasn't even married, didn't have that relationship. I mean, he relied on other people for food, for meals. This is the life Jesus lived, and he modeled contentment with, with, contentment with his life. And we look at this formula, I call it a formula in verse 6, godliness, being like Jesus, plus contentment, being satisfied with what we have in life right now, leads to greatness. I think greatness is something we all want. We want to have a great life. A great life comes from godliness plus contentment. And many of us, we know that, but we overlook it. And we consistently pursue more. I got to get a little bit more. A little bit more in my bank account, a little bit bigger house, a little bit better car, better clothes, better shoes, and better relationship. If I can just keep getting better. And listen, understand something. There's nothing wrong with getting better. Being better isn't sinful. Having more isn't sinful. Improving your life, it isn't sinful. But being discontent with God's blessings in your life, that's where the problem starts. And Paul says in this portion of Scripture, greatness comes from being content and being godly. So that's where we start. The second truth here is that contentment based on earthly riches is ultimately going to fail you. You can't keep the riches you gain. People want to get rich. If getting rich is your life goal, that's a bad goal. Now, see, that's one of those obvious idols, right? Money, riches, is an obvious idol, but it relates to contentment, and it sneaks into our lives. I don't know if anybody um, here heard, but Joe Burrow, the quarterback of the Bengals, is now making $55 million a year. Anybody here making that kind of money? I need to know, all right? We have a debt to pay off. But the truth is, you know what? Like, the truth is, uh, he earned it, right? I mean, like, he had those last few years, and that's what it pays in the NFL. And if you're a Bengals fan, you're excited for him, but you're also not happy you're own two right now, right? I know. But the truth is, Joe Burrow can buy anything. Some of you might be jealous of that. He can buy anything he wants in this world, right? There's nothing that can stop him from having any possession that he wants. And I'm not angry about that. And if you're jealous about that, you know, you need to commit that to the Lord. But the truth is, he cannot take anything with him when he leaves this life. He is just like the rest of us. When we leave this life, we don't get to take it with us. And that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. You know, you're going to have all this, but you brought nothing into the world. You'll take nothing with you. You can get rich, but you can't stay rich. It's important that you understand if you're blessed with riches, you better handle it well. You know what? All of us in this room, probably those of us especially that are older know stories of people who made it. Maybe they didn't make as much as Joe, but they made a lot of money. And in the world's eyes, in terms of money and possessions, they got it. I mean, they, they made it. Yet they never found contentment in their life. You know people like that. You've heard stories of people that won the lottery, right? That, that blew all the money, drugs, gambling, just bad life choices. And it's hard to imagine that, right? If I had all this money, I'd be content. If you make money your goal, if you make that your goal in life, there's a good chance you'll never be content. That's what Paul is saying to us here. There's nothing wrong with being rich and having stuff, but remember, it's temporary. A third truth he gives us here is that the lack of contentment leads to temptation and destruction. People who want to get rich fall into temptation in a trap. That's what he said in verse 9. My wife and I, maybe a month ago or so, we watched this show on Netflix about Oxycontin, the rise of Oxycontin in our country. It was like six episodes, and it was disgusting, really, to see what happened with this pharmaceutical company and the greed of the owners of that company. I mean, that, that drug is a powerful drug, and it can be useful and helpful for people as a painkiller, for sure, but it's highly addictive. 
and the creators of it knew it, but they marketed it in a way to make as much money as they could. They were all about money, and they didn't care. They knew it was addictive. They didn't care. Thousands and thousands of lives were lost and still continue to be because of it, but they made a lot of money. They chased it. They chased it so much, and it was this just a powerful addiction that it had on people's lives. But in the end, what Paul said came true, ruin and destruction for the consumers and for the company. And that leads to this verse that we read that we often misquote, or we hear misquoted. You've probably heard somebody say that money is the root of all evil. That's in the Bible? Not quite. Those first two words matter, the love of money. Love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money is an evil, but the love of it is, elevating it to the level of an idol. And like I said, this series is about sneaky idols, and money's not sneaky, right? We know that's an idol. But this idea of contentment, this is where we are today. This is what we're talking about today. This is what Paul's addressing. Number four, he said, the lack of contentment can impede your journey of faith. Some people, he said, eager for money have wandered from the faith. Um, there's a lot of people in life that are on this journey with God and then opportunities come up that take them away from God. And of course, there are some people that need to work on Sunday. And I'm glad that we have people at our hospitals. I'm glad we have law enforcement. There's a lot of things that have to happen every day of the week. And I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about people that make life choices knowing that it's going to take them on a path that takes them away from God. And Paul is saying over and over and over here, look, don't let anything disrail your journey of faith. And money and possessions can definitely do that. Go back to the Gospels, the story that Jesus told. Jesus would tell parables to illustrate truths, and he told a story of the parable of the sower and the seed. Some of you might remember that. He talks about a farmer who's planting seed, and the seed represents the Word of God. And he says when he goes out to plant seed, there's four different kinds of soil. And he describes the four soils. And the soil that we should be, strive to be, is the good soil that receives the word of God and it grows in us. But one of the kinds of soil that Jesus described was the kind that was full of thorns and thistles and weeds. And then Jesus explains the parable. And he said, that kind of soil, that particular kind, is the kind that represents those people who allow the word of God to get choked out in their lives by the cares of this life, by the deceitfulness of wealth, by desires for more things. And Jesus is saying, look, if that's where you are, if you're not content, you're not going to hear the word of God and it's not going to take root in your life. Paul said in this passage we're looking at, some people eager for money have pierced themselves with many sorrows. So money, it's a great servant. It's a terrible master. If you set your heart on money, money will break your heart. It's not all there is in this life. And we, we know what the Bible says, godliness with contentment is great gain. And we have to learn it. Paul said, learn the art of contentment. Learn it when you have little. And then when you have much, continue to keep learning it. We have to learn this. So this brings to this question, brings us to this question. When is contentment then a sneaky idol? When does it hurt us? How is contentment a bad thing? How do we idolize contentment? When is it actually dangerous for us to pursue contentment? we got to be honest with ourselves. This is crucial today. I don't think anybody in this room claims to be perfect. I've met many of you, and I know you would never say that about yourself. We know that. There's only one perfect person that ever lived this earth. That's Jesus, right? Jesus was perfect. But we also know that our goal and our desire should be to be like Jesus. Paul said godliness means becoming more like Jesus, really. We're supposed to be more like him. That doesn't mean on this earth we'll ever be perfect, but we should constantly in our lives be moving toward becoming more like Jesus. That should be our goal. So we need to realize it's okay to be confident in our growth as people, as followers of Jesus, in our efforts to be kind, to be generous, to be loving, to be a witness like we just sang. All those things are good things, and we should be confident in our growth, but not content with where we are. So contentment is dangerous when we rest on our spiritual success. I want you to think about this for a minute. 
This is when contentment can be a sneaky idol. When you and I start resting on our spiritual success. Now, I don't think that we have a lot of people in our church that are like, I am an A-plus Christian. Like, I am the best, and I, I really think that of myself. But here's what I'm going to say. There's a lot of us that have a little bit too much confidence in where we are. Now, first of all, spiritual success, how do we define that? What is it? Well, let me give you a few li- things on the list. Like, first of all, you have heaven locked in. You're like, I prayed, and I invited Jesus into my life, and I'm a believer in Jesus. I know I'm going to heaven. In fact, I filed that up with a public profession, and I got baptized. So I am locked in. That's a success. Sure, it is. I read my Bible. I pray sometimes. I go to church every week unless I'm sick or I'm on vacation. Great. I tithe 10% of my income. Wow, great. I'm a spiritual success. I mean, I serve in the church. I have a ministry. I do something to help. I bring my family to church. I have a Christian marriage. My wife and I are on the same page. We bring our kids, put them in kids' ministry, bring them on Sunday night for the well when they're teenagers. Like, we are doing everything. We even joined a small group Bible study. In fact, even though I'm not perfect, I got no major areas of sin in my life, like no big things. And I'm respected. People in the church respect me. The church leaders respect me. I'm pretty successful as a Christian. And what can happen is we can rest in our spiritual successes And you know what that leads to? It can lead to spiritual pride. We can feel pretty good about ourselves. And what I want you to hear today is that pride goes before a fall. It says that in Proverbs. You've heard that before. Pride goes before a fall. In fact, Jesus addressed this, and he doesn't want us to fall. He doesn't want us to stumble. He wants us to understand we should not be resting in our spiritual successes. We need to keep growing. We need to keep going. And to illustrate this, Jesus told a story about two guys that went into the temple to pray. Some of you know this story. Two guys went into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, a good guy, a religious teacher, knew the Old Testament laws. And the other guy was a tax collector, scum. Everybody hated tax collectors. Uh, They stole from people for themselves. They worked for the Roman government. People hated them. They were considered the worst kind of sinner. And so Jesus tells this story about both of them going into the temple to pray. It's in Luke chapter 18. Let me read it to you. It says, Jesus told the story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness. I hope that's not descriptive of us, right? Great confidence in our own righteousness. People who scorned everyone else. He's addressing a crowd of people that some of them had this problem of pride. Too much confidence, too much belief in themselves that they're good. They got it figured out. Because when we have it figured out, and we think we have it figured out, it can cause us to look down on other people. And being overconfident in our relationship with Jesus, it might mean that we've stopped growing. So in verse 10, Jesus said two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other one was a despised tax collector. To give you a little more context, the the Pharisee would be like a maybe modern-day Bible teacher of today. I mean, they knew the Bible really well. In fact, the Pharisee knew all 613 Let me say that again, 613 Old Testament laws. They could quote them to you, and they lived them out in their life. And they they were good. I mean, they were good people. They were respected. See, we talk about Pharisees today when we preach sermons in a very bad light, like they were these awful people. But in that day, they were respected, respected religious people. And so you got that person over here, and then over here you got a tax collector. Like I said, people hated them. It's hard to find a modern-day equivalent of a tax collector. It's not like somebody that works for the IRS. You might not like them, but they're doing something legal. It could be like a politician who's corrupt, who lines their pockets with your money. It could be a drug dealer that deals in his own neighborhood. I don't know what you want to think about, but talking about somebody who everybody would be against and not like. Jesus said these two people came in the church together to pray at the same time. Verse 11. Listen to this. The Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers, and I'm certainly not like that tax collector. Now, just can you imagine how uncomfortable that was? You ever been in a situation like that? One person over here saying, I'm so thankful I'm not as bad as that person? (laughs) I was thinking about that. Like I was laying in bed last night thinking about the sermon, and I remembered not that long ago I was in a meeting 
something I volunteer for that has nothing to do with the church. And I was in a meeting of about 30 people, and there was this open discussion, and several people were talking really bad about this one person. And I was like, oh, man, this is really bad. And then I was like, is that that person that's actually sitting over there? And I whispered to a person I'm next to, I said, is, are they talking about them? He's like, yep. I was like, wow, they're saying all that right here openly? Yep. I was like, this is awful. Also, can I have some popcorn? Because this is really good, a good show. I'm like, wow, I can't believe I'm watching this happen. Um, I never, you don't see that. We don't have that in our church meetings. But um, anyway, I'm thinking about this story of a, of a guy who's like super good religious guy praying and then like saying, I'm so much better than him. And we're like, that's awful. We're all like appalled by it, right? He's saying, God, thank you that I'm not like him. Thank you, God, that, you know, I fast twice a week and I tithe my income. I am such a good person. And then Jesus shows us a different way. Verse 13. The tax collector stood at a distance and he dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. What a huge contrast. He, he stood at a distance. He didn't even feel worthy to be in the temple or to look up at God. He had this prayer of confession and acknowledgement of who he was. See, the Pharisee thought of himself as a gift to God rather than a receiver of God's blessings. I'm a gift. This guy over here was like, man, I'm just begging for mercy. I'm not attempting to justify anything that I've done. And what Jesus said is powerful in verse 14. He said, I tell you what, this sinner, not the Pharisee, but the sinner returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That was a shocking statement for Jesus to say that about a respected person in society. The message is clear. And that leads to my last warning about this sneaky idol of contentment. Contentment is dangerous when we stop growing in our faith. That's the kind of contentment that's a sneaky idol. When we think we've arrived, you know, like, I'm good. Of course I'm not perfect, but I'm good. You know, I've done what I need to do. I've been there and I've done that. I, I, I've been to a lot of churches. I've served in a lot of ministries. I've read the Bible through. I mean, I probably win Bible trivia if we play. Like, I, I've done, I've given a lot. I've served a lot. I know the stories. I, I've led a group. I've been in a group. I've, you know, I've done it all. Like, I'm just kind of like, I'm locked in with heaven. I'm like, good. I'm just gonna, you know what? Uh, I, I know, I know theology. I know that it's not of works that I'm saved. It's by the grace of God that I have salvation. And I also know that I don't have to work to keep my salvation. I don't have to do all this stuff. So I'm like, I'm good. I'm locked in. You know what? I got it. I got it going on. I'll serve when I feel like it. I'll do what I feel like. But I'm, I'm good. And there's so many people that get in that mindset. You might not say it the way I just said it, obviously. That sounds arrogant, right? But be wary of, of that in your life or when you hear that. I know I'm always taken aback. When I talk to people, and sometimes it's regular people that I, that I come in contact with or even other pastors that seem to have it all together, have an answer for everything. I, I know that. I've done that. I can tell you how to do that. I'm like, hold on a minute. Sometimes that, that arrogant person that seems to have it all figured out they're lying to themselves. And sometimes when we're overly confident, the scary part about that is what it can lead to in our lives, making more mistakes, falling into sin, hurting more people, crashing and burning. Because most of us know stories of people that are like that, that took shortcuts. They were like, oh yeah, I'm a believer in Jesus. And then something happens. You know, people that are very successful in the sports world, like some of the, the greatest successes that we could name were like Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, they didn't just win one championship and one MVP. You know why? Because after they won the first one, they weren't content with the trophy. They're like, I want another one. I want to keep going. I want to keep getting better. And you know, if you're in training for something, you know you have to adapt. Your body gets used to the training you're doing. You got to keep adapting your body, training more, the moving goal in front of you. And that's how it should be as we pursue this relationship with Jesus. It's a moving goal. Like, okay, I'm, I'm more like Jesus than I was a year ago but I'm not there yet, so I'm going to keep striving to become more like Jesus this year, more and more and more of him every single day of my life. And just like there's these great stories of famous athletes that are super successful, there's a lot of sad stories. I looked it up this week. I was uh, on Google looking at some of these guys who 
were incredible in college, got these big contracts, all different sports, and then they just were terrible. Some of it, you know, could be injury, but a lot of times they got that signing bonus and it just messed them up. They got crazy, you know, with their money, gambling, drugs, guns, crime, you name it. It's just, it's sad, sad story. I don't want to be a sad story as a follower of Jesus. And I think when we let our guard down, when we start thinking, hey, I'm content, I'm good, I'm locked in, I got it all figured out, I do some of the spiritual things that you listed, I mean, I'm good with God. (laughs) That's when we're in danger. That's when we're in danger of falling into these sins that Paul was talking about when he talked to Timothy. When you start getting content, man, you can content with your life and your walk with God and you think I got it all figured out and I'm not growing anymore, that's when we're in trouble. So today as we close, like look, all of us here together today, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're on this journey, we're on this together, we're all at different places and one of the things we should never do is say, well, I'm good because I'm better than like two-thirds of the church. And you could identify people, you're in a small group and like, hmm, I'm on the top half, (laughs) you know, like, I'm good. That's not what it's about. It's not about comparing. It's about becoming more and more like Jesus. And guess what? None of us are there. None of us have gotten to that point where we're like Jesus yet. So the goal in life as a follower of Jesus is to become more and more like him. So don't get content with where you are right now in your walk with God. That can be a sneaky idol in your life. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to share your word this morning. God, thank you for what you're teaching us and how you're growing us. And Lord, I pray for every single person in this room and those listening online, I pray for those right now today that are struggling with this contentment that's taken a hold of their life. They're just like, eh, not growing. God, I pray for them. I pray that they would not be bored with their faith or, or content with where they are, but they would continue to grow in their walk with you. Lord, I pray you'd help them, encourage them today in any way to be motivated, God, to continue to pursue you every single day of their lives. God, thank you for being with us this morning. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.